The Black Vampire, a legend of Saint Domingo. So I have seen upon another shore another lion give a grievous roar, and the last lion thought the first a boar, bombast, furios. Introduction. If any person should have patience to read the following narrative and can discover the author's drift, it is more than he can do himself. If it be thought exquisite nonsense, it is more than the writer dares hope. And if it be pronounced simple, stupid, and unadulterated absurdity, his own private opinion will perfectly coincide with that of the public. He began to write without any fable, and before he had found any, had spun out the thread of his ideas. This tangled skin of absurdities is now exposed to criticism from the laudable motive of showing of how much nonsense an individual may be delivered in the short space of two afternoons, without any excuse but idleness or any object but amusement. The prominent descriptions, which it is here attempted to ridicule, are fresh in the memory of all who have read The White Vampire, and to those who have not, the superstition must be so familiar that it is unnecessary to make useless extracts. That the author may not, however, be misunderstood, it may be necessary to state that in the speech of the vampire, he had no design of descending to that meanest of all intellectual exercises, a travesty on authors who are justly admired, but meant, if anything, to simply show how passages, which were fine in their original use when garbled by the ignorant and tasteless, became a melancholy rhapsody of nonsense. But first on earth, as vampire sent, the corpse shall from its tomb be rent, then ghastly haunt thy native place and suck the blood of all thy race. There from thy daughter, sister, wife, at midnight drain the stream of life. Yet loathe the banquet which perforce must feed thy livid living course. Thy victims, ere they yet expire, shall know the demon for their sire. As cursing thee, thou cursing them, Thy flowers are withered on the stem, but one that for thy crime must fall, the youngest, best beloved of all, shall bless thee with a father's name. That word shall wrap thy heart in flame. Yet thou must end thy task and mark her cheek's last tinge, her eye's last spark, and the last glassy glance must view, which freezes over its lifeless blue. Then with unhallowed hands shall tear the tresses of her yellow hair, of which in life a lock when shorn, affection's fondest pledge was worn, but now is borne away by the memorial of thine agony. Yet with thine own best blood shall drip thy gnashing tooth and haggard lip. Then stalking to thy sullen grave, go, and with ghouls and afrites rave. Till these in horror shrink away from spectre more cursed than they. Byron. The Black Vampire. Mr. Anthony Gibbons was a gentleman of African extraction. His ancestors emigrated from the eastern coast of Guinea in a French ship and were sold in St. Domingo, remarkably cheap. As they were reduced to mere skeletons by the yaws of the passage, and all died shortly after their arrival, except one small negro of a very slender constitution, and fit for no work whatever, the gentleman who purchased him charitably knocked out his brains, and the body was thrown into the ocean. The tide returning in the night, it was washed upon the sands, and the moon then shining bright, the gentleman was taking a walk to enjoy the coolness of the evening judge of his surprise when the little corpse got up and complaining of a pain in its bowels begged for some bread and butter. The planter, supposing his business to have been but half done, kicked him back in the water. The element seemed very familiar to him and he swam back with much more grace and agility, parting the sparkling waves of his jet black members, polished like ebony, but reflecting no single beam of light. His complexion was a dead black his eyes a pure white, the iris was flame color, and the pupils of a clear, moonshiny luster, but so peculiarly constructed that, though prominent, they seemed to look into his own head. His hair was neither curled nor straight, but feathery, like the plumage of a crow. 
Having paddled again on shore, he came crawling crab fashion to the feet of Mr. Persone. The latter gentleman, in a considerable alarm, not knowing whether it was Satan, Obi, or some other worthy with whom he had to deal, mustered up sufficient resolution to tie a large stone round the boy's middle. Then, with a main exertion of strength, he hurled him into the sparkling ocean. He fell where the reflection of the moon was brightest, and sunk like lead, but immediately rose again like cork, perpendicularly, with the stone under his arm while the radiant luster of the planet retreated from his dark figure, exhibiting in its most striking contrast its utter blackness. In this predicament he came buoyant to land, surrounded, as he seemed, by a sphere of magic luster. He now walked up to the Frenchman, with his arms akimbo and looking remarkably fierce. Mr. Persone's particular hairs stood up on end, but being ashamed that a little negro of ten years old should put him in bodily fear, he knocked him down. The guinea man rose again, without bending a joint, as fast as Mr. Persone could upset him. He recovered his altitude, just like one of those small toys fabricated from pith, tipped with lead, called witches and hobgoblins by the rising generation. The planter, in utter amazement and despair, took hold of the child by both his extremities, and pressing him to the earth, sat down upon him. Then, hallowing for his attendants... He ordered a tremendous fire to be kindled on the sand. This was accordingly done. The Gaul congratulated himself on his perseverance and sagacity, and as he had never heard of inaqueous animals, was confident that though the water fiend was so expert in his own element, he could not stand the fiery ordeal. The boy, meanwhile, lay perfectly passive, as if he had been a mere log. But presently, when the pile was all in a light ablaze, with a sudden expansion like that of a compressed Indian rubber, he popped Mr. Persone up into the air many yards, and he alighted head foremost into the fire, where he had intended to have dedicated the saber brat with his nine lives to Moloch. Whatever the Negro was, it is notorious that Mr. Persone was no salamander. He was rescued from the pyre, which, like Hercules, he had, though unwittingly, erected for himself looking like a squizzed cat and having apparently no life left in his body. The attention of the domestics was drawn entirely to their master, who soon betrayed signs of animation, though he exhibited a most awful spectacle, being one continually sore and blister. His whole body was one wound, as Virgil or some other poet has hyperbolically expressed himself. Mr. Persone, when he perfectly recovered his senses, found himself in his own bed wrapped in greasy sheets and smarting as if in a cayenne bath. He called for a glass of brandy, his dear wife, Euphemia, and his infant son, who had not yet been christened. His lady, with streaming eyes, presented herself before him, and after tenderly inquiring into the state of his health, told him, with a voice interrupted with sobs and hiccups, that when she went in the morning to see her baby, whom she had left in the cradle, there was nothing to be seen but the skin, hair, and nails. She declared that there never was such another object, except indeed the excisation in Scudder's museum. On the receipt of this horrid intelligence, Mr. Persone was seized with a violent spasmodic affection, and shortly after expired, muttering something about Sacra and the Guinea Negro. The amiable but unfortunate Euphemia was thrown into several hysterical convulsions, as well she might be, poor woman when her husband had been made a holocaust and served up like a broiled and peppered chicken to feed the grim maw of death. And her interesting infant, the first pledge of her pure and perfect love, had been precociously sucked like an unripe orange and nothing left but its beautiful and tender skin. The disconsolate widow caused her husband to be embalmed, and he was buried amid the lamentations and tears of all the funeral, much regretted by all who had the honor of his acquaintance, particularly by his negroes who could not soon forget him, as he had left too many sincere marks of his regard upon their backs, to be ever obliterated from the recollections. Time, as all the Greek tragedians, Solomon, and others have remarked, is a benevolent deity. Mrs. Persone's grief yielded to the soothing hand of the consoling power, and her bloom and spirits returned with more luster and elasticity than they had before exhibited 
as the rose that had drooped in the fury of the passing storm erects its blushing honors and shows more beautiful and vivid tints when the squall is over. Many years after these occurrences took place, while Euphemia was in second mourning for her third husband, he was indulging in the luxury of solitary grief and reading Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy and the melancholy poems of Dr. Farmer in an orangerie. The refreshing breezes from the ocean which now tempered the sultry heats of the declining day, the soft perfume of the opening blossoms, and the mellow tints of the evening sky shedded that holy light, so dear to sensitive hearts, diffused a calm over her soul, wrapped in the contemplation of departed days. While lost in the pensive reverie, she perceived two strangers approaching her in the extremity of the long vista of the grove. One of them was a colored gentleman of remarkable height and deep jetty blackness, a perfect model of the Congo Apollo. He was dressed in the rich garb of a Moorish prince and led by the hand of a pale European boy in an Asiatic dress, whose languid countenance, slender form, and tristful gait were strongly contrasted with the poorly appearance of majestic step of his conductor. They both saluted the lovely widow and after an interchange of compliments accepted her polite invitation to set down and take tea with her in the bower. She learned from the elder stranger that he had brought out a cargo of slaves, whom his subjects had lately taken prisoners in war, and whom he had resolved to dispose of himself, as he was desirous of seeing the world. His page, he said, was an orphan left by a slave merchant in Africa. The manners and conversation of the prince had an irresistible charm. The regal port was manifest in his gigantic and well-proportioned frame, and majesty was conspicuous on his brow without its diadem. The turban and crescent had never graced a nobler front, but the winning condescension of his tones and language, while they could not banish the feeling of the presence of royalty, removed every restraint incident to that consciousness. He criticized the works which Euphemia had been perusing with masterly precision and displayed more knowledge than even the accomplished ideologist of Lady Morgan with infinitely more discretion and good sense. It is remarked by the Abbey Raynal that there is a peculiar elegance and beauty in the complexion of the Africans when the eyes and nose are accustomed to their hue and odor. This truth was realized by Euphemia as she gazed on the open visage of her illustrious guest. She thought surely that in him nature might stand up and say, This was a man. And certainly it is only the weakness and imperfection of our human senses, which, penetrating no further than the surface, is forever deceived by superficial shadows. The Empyrean is always blue, whatever vapors may float in our contracted atmosphere. And if we gaze at the rows of skulls which festoon and garnish Surgeon's Hall, we can apply no standard to determine their relative beauty. They are all equally ugly, and the block of Helen might be mistaken for that of Medusa. Shakespeare, true to nature, had also remarked, Black men are pearls in beauteous ladies' eyes. The beauty, then, the royalty, gentility, and various accomplishments of the Bambuck monarch made captive the too sensible heart of the French widow. She forgot her ogles, graces, and even her loquacity rooted to her seat and fixed in immovable contemplation of the African's face. What peculiar feature or lineament attracted her attention she knew not. His eyes, though bright, did not sparkle, and the iris, though a more vivid red than the roseate line in the rainbow, emitted no scintillations. In fact, his whole countenance seemed to look and to perambulate her own. The conversation gradually assumed a more impassioned and amorous complexion. And the little page, who though meager and emaciated, evidently showed that he was no gump for his years, taking certain broad hints, cast a mournful and intelligent look on the widow, said he would fetch a short walk in the plantation and left the orangerie. The prince, then spreading his glittering sash upon the grass, went down on his knees upon it and broke out into the most ardent exclamations of love and admiration and professions of constant attachment. He said that the flat-nosed beauties of Zara, the scarred, squab figures of the Golden Coast, the well-proportioned Zilias, Calypsos, and Zamas on the banks of the Niger, and even the great Hottentot Venus herself, 
had never for a moment made the least impression on his heart. His passion was a mystery to himself, its origin secret as the sources of the Nile, but full and impetuous as its ample channel when replenished from the celestial fountains of Abyssinia. While if Mrs. Dubois would shine upon its waves, its enlivened currents would fertilize his vast dominions in the luxuriant realms of Central Africa, making them to fructify yet more abundantly with burning gold and radiant diamonds. What female heart could resist such pleadings and the compliment implied in such a preference? When Zambo, the page, returned, the parties had agreed to be privately united on the same evening. The ceremony was accordingly performed on the spot by the family chaplain of Mrs. Dubois, not without many remonstrances on his part as to the impropriety of marrying a Negro. The prince did not see to resent the affront, which, by the by, he had no right to do, as the priest got nothing for the job. Zambo, too, was extremely restless, till Mrs. Dubois gave him some sweet meats which seemed to quiet his conscience, after which he took some stiff punch and fell asleep. About midnight the prince came to him, and shaking him by the ears, had him rise and follow him. His bride was hanging on his arm in an enchanting dishabille, and did not seem to be in perfect possession of her right senses. Zambo mournfully followed the new-married pair. They went silently out the back door with cautious steps and proceeded through the orangerie. No breath of wind was stirring. The moon was on the zenith surrounded by a pale halo of ghostly luster. When they had crossed the plantation, they came to a place of sepulchre, where the dark cypresses and lugubrious mahogany admitted but sparse and glimmering streaks of funereal light, which falling on the rank foliage, the white monuments and broken ground beneath presented a thousand dusky shapes, flitting in the dim uncertainty dear to superstition. Vague terrors seized on the mind of the bride, and she began very naturally to inquire what was the use of getting out of a comfortable bed and trailing through the heavy dew in her undress to such an unusual spot for midnight recreation. They now stood near the spot where her three husbands, several children, and the skin, hair, and nails of her first baby were deposited in a row. At the foot of a tamarind lay her third son, whose Christian name was Spooner, and who died, according to the tombstone, in a fit of intoxication aged seven years and six months. On him she had bestowed a greater share of tenderness than any of her other offspring, and his loss had caused her most affliction. The African, making observations on the grave, began to strip himself very expediously, assisted by Zembo, who seemed to recover from his blues and by his activity and eagerness manifested his expectation of soon seeing some fine sport. Presently, the two genie, or gentlemen, or whatever they were, turned towards the east and performed certain antic prostrations, throwing handfuls of earth three times over their heads. Then returning to the tomb, they tore up the sods with ravenous fury, and soon drew out the last-mentioned son of the lady and threw him on the grass beside the grave. Zambo fell as fiercely upon the corpse as a hungry dog upon his dinner, but was arrested by the African, who lent him a severe box on the ear which sent him blubbering to a corner of the cemetery. What added both to the mother's horrors and admiration was that the body of her child was perfectly fresh, and the olfactory nerves experienced no unsavory sensation from its proximity. While its cheeks were diffused with so deep a tinge of scarlet, that they shone like ruddy fireballs in the darkness of the spot. Her husband drew a golden goblet from beneath a large stone. Then, bending over the corpse, he scooped out the heart. With his long and polished nails, and having pressed the blood into the chalice, mingled with it some dark particles gathered from the newly turned up earth. From the pure and scanty lymph, which gushed nearby and flickered like a streak of quick silvery light in the moonbeam, he added a third ingredient to the potion. Then, seizing his passive and trembling spouse by the throat and presenting the unnatural mixture to her lips, he cried in a hollow voice, whose very infliction thrilled each fiber of its victim. Swear, or if that is against your principles, affirm by this dirty blood and bloody dirt, by this watery blood and bloody water, by this watery dirt and dirty water, 
that you will never disclose in any manner aught of what you have seen and shall see this night. Call them all to witness your wish, that in the moment when you even conceive the thought of perjury, your bowels may burst out and your bones rot, swear, and drink. The affrighted woman murmured, as articulately as the iron grip of the monster would suffer her, that she was not thirsty and had not breath enough to aspirate such a terrible conjuration. No trifling, roared the fiend. You have not a moment to deliberate. But his bellowing and threats were vain, and he found to his mortification that he had gotten the wrong sow by the ear, or rather by the throat. She stuttered out in the most pitiful accents, which would have softened any heart, but a vampire has none that though she was by no means partial to the delectable confectionery of the pharmacopoeia, calomel and jalap, impacacuna and rhubarb and tartar and medic, she would rather take them all collectively and individually than the unchristian decoction he held against her teeth. Foaming with madness till the white slaver flowed down his sable limbs, the African hurled Mrs. Persone, Dubois, etc., etc., on the grave of her first husband and stamping violently on the earth it seemed to heave as with the throes of an earthquake. Immediately the tumuli yawned, the ponderous stones and slabs were shaken from their ancient sockets, and the ghastly dead in uncouth attitudes crawled from their nooks, with their hair curling in torturous and serpent twinings, and their eyeballs of fire bursting from their heads. While, as they extended their withered arms and tapering fingers, furnished with bloodhound claws, Their gory shrouds fell in wild drapery around them, transiently revealing their forms, bloated as if to bursting, and often incarnadined with clotted blood, yet warm and dripping. The lady, as those who have been in similar predicaments may suppose, soon lost her recollection. Not, however, before she had seen Zembo busily employed in tearing up the grave of her first husband. She saw herself surrounded by the specters and lost all consciousness. When reason and sense returned, she found herself in the same place, and it was also the midnight hour. She was laying by the grave of Mr. Persone, and her breast was stained with blood. A wide wound appeared to have been inflicted there, but was now cicatrized. Imagine, if you can, her surprise, when by a certain carnivorous craving in her maw, and by putting this and that together, she found she was a vampire and gathered from her indistinct reminiscences of the preceding night that she had been then sucked, and that it was now her turn to eject the peaceful tenants of the grave. With this delightful prospect of immortality before her, she began to examine the graves, or subject to satisfy her furious appetite. When she had selected one to her mind, a new marvel arrested her attention. Her first husband got up out of his coffin, and with all the grace so natural to his countrymen, made her low bow in the last fashion and open his arms to receive her. What were the emotions of this fond couple when, after a lingering separation for sixteen years, they again embraced each other with the ardor of an affection equal to their earliest transports, and which their long divorce seemed only to increase, tenderly inquiring into the state of each other's health and the accidents which had been fallen them during this disjunction? They forgot even their hunger and thirst, and sitting down on a tombstone made a thousand inquiries, which, however, they related to family concerns might not be as interesting to the reader as they were to the parties concerned. Mr. Person, however, looked rather glum when he learned that his lady had been thrice married since his decease. But she assured him that she would never more tolerate the addresses of another suitor. And as for the two husbands, they were rotten enough by this time, as she was confident they had not attended the vampire ball on the preceding night. As for her sable spouse, she trusted that he would never again appear to interrupt her happiness. But while she was expressing this hope, the gentleman in question, like his relation below, according to the old proverb, came upon the ground, with Zembo, Mr. Persone, having neither sword nor pistols at hand, armed himself with a gigantic thigh bone and warned the Black Prince to stand upon his guard as he meant to punish him severely. But Zembo, rushing between the parties, raised his hands in a supplicating posture, while the generous monarch, making a salam to his antagonist, begged him 
keep himself quiet and look behind him. They both turned round on this intimation when, to the utter confusion of the lady, her second and third husbands, Messieurs Marcand and Dubois arose from the graves, where they had been lovingly deposited by the side of each other. They both advanced to salute their wife, but Mr. Persone, brandishing his thigh bone, warned them to stand off. And he had the first title to the lady. Much confusion would have ensued had not the African prince interfered. He told the gentleman that so delicate a point could only be settled in an honorable way and proposed that Mr. Marcand and Mr. Dubois should first settle their difference in a personal encounter, after which Mr. Persone might give the survivor gentlemanly satisfaction. To this, all parties assented. As they were already stripped, the combatants shook hands to show their mutual goodwill and proceeded to action without further ceremony. Mr. Dubois soon brought Claret from Mr. Marcand, who, in returning the compliment, fibbed Mr. Dubois so severely in the bowels that he lost his wind, and, gasping for breath, smote the air on all sides, without any of his blows telling. He came to the ground, and his bones rattled as he fell. But soon recovering his breath, he made a desperate attack on Mr. Marcand's sconce, and favored him with so terrible a facer under the gills that he fell incontinently like a bull smitten in his front. But entangling his own heels with those of Mr. Dubois, they both came simultaneously to the ground, striking their heads against different tombstones and knocking out their own brains. They rose again, refreshed like the giant of old, by their grappling with the earth, and all the better for the loss of their wits, which indeed was a mere trifle. But the African, who had no time to see more sport, fixed them to the sod by his superior strength, and Zambo dexterously pinned them fast by driving stakes through their hearts with a large sledgehammer, which he carried about his person for such emergencies. During the operation, their roaring surpassed that which is performed by the lioness, when bereft of her whelps. But as soon as they were fairly nailed to the counter, they lay motionless and breathless a horrible pair of spectacles of sin and misery. The African assured the lady that she never need fear their second resurrection, and Mr. Persone politely offered to settle their controversy in any mode most agreeable to the prince, either to box with him on the spot or appoint a meeting in the future with pistols, rifles, small or broadsword, or else they might toss up, who should set fire to a barrel of gunpowder. The prince said that quarreling was all nonsense, and offered his hand. But Mr. Persone refused, saying, Don't be too familiar, Blackie, and renewing his threats of cracking him over the noodle with the thigh bone. The generous monarch pocketed the affront. You have been, he said, sufficiently rewarded for the cruelties you practiced upon my person several years ago. I forgive you, my dear sir, what you performed and intended to perform on me. Here is your son, who has grown considerably, as you may observe, and I assure you that his education has not been neglected. To his exertions last night, you are indebted for your revivification. And as you may remember, you were embalmed. You have kept quite sweet and fresh ever since your internment. Amiable and virtuous vampires, may you long enjoy that tranquility and contentment, which your merit and accomplishments so eminently deserve. A vessel lies in the port, ready to sail for Europe in an hour. The island is no longer a place for you. Here is money to pay your passages, and all I have to say is that the sooner you're off, the better. Farewell. So saying, he departed, without waiting for the acknowledgments of the party. Mr. Persone and his lady, whom we shall again call by their first marriage name, did not exactly comprehend what their dingy benefactor meant by bidding them take French leave of the island, like pickpockets and outlaws. But, as they were wondering at their own existence, like Adam and Eve, their first day of their creation, and as they had reason to believe the prince a potent magician, who could rouse the dead from their searments and turn the planets from their courses, for these reasons they concluded to follow his bidding without any impertinent scruples. But as the keen edge of their hunger had been whetted by delay, they would fain have taken supper, and digested a little something wherewithal to strengthen them before they set out. Zembo, 
who had filled his own bread basket very lately and was in no such urgent necessity, protested with all the vehemence which filial reverence would permit against the unseasonable gratification of their unnatural craving and recited with just emphasis and good discretion an extract from Councillor Phillips' harangue about the cannibal appetite of his rejected altar, which his parents did not understand and, of course, thought very sublime. But even this masterpiece of mystical eloquence would have been delivered in vain had not the boy given other reasons of such cogency, that they licked their lips, cast a longing, lingered look at the graveyard, and followed him without more opposition. They prosecuted their nocturnal march through closely woven and solemn groves until they descended into a profound valley where the light of the pale planet of magic adoration streamed and quivered on serried files of bright armory. The leader of the band seemed to have expected their arrival, and mutual tokens of recognition passed between him and Zembo. The whole company then set forward their array in silence. No cymbal clashed, no clarion rang, Still were the pipe and drum. Save heavy tread and armor's clang, the sullen march was dumb. By continual descent, they seemed to have penetrated the bowels of a cavern, whose ramifications ran under the sea as they heard a murmuring roar as of the ocean above their heads. The party, by the instructions of Zembo, dispersed themselves in different directions, until they had enclosed the interior of the rock where its largest chamber was to speak catacharistically so artfully concealed by nature that no one not instructed by an adept in its subterranean topography could ever have detected the secret of its existence. It had been in former days a place of deposit and asylum for the buccaneers, and its situation had been since known only to the professors of the Obia art who held here their midnight orgies. Mr. and Mrs. Persone, guided by their son, were placed in a situation where, through the crevices of the inner partition of the rock, they could observe what was passing in the interior. It seemed at first a vast hall of Arabian romance, supported by immense shafts and studded with precious stones, so various and beautiful were the hues which the different spars assumed in the light of a hundred torches blazing in every quarter and illuminating the farthest recesses of the cave. The walls were decorated with other appendages, which added to the mystery, if not to the embellishment of the scene. Being irregularly stained with blood, decorated with rude tapestry of many colored plumage, and stuccoed with the beaks of parrots, the teeth of dogs and alligators, bones of cats, broken glass and eggshells, plastered with a composition of rum and grave dirt, the implements of Negro witchcraft. At one extremity of the extensive apartment, on a kind of natural throne, sat several black moors in sumptuous Moorish apparel, whom by their swollen forms and remarkable eyes Mrs. Person knew to be ghouls, and among whom she recognized her late husband. The whole range of this vast amphitheater sweeping from before the throne was occupied by slaves, rudely attired and imperfectly armed with clubs and missiles. A decent platoon of black guards were posted before the vampire monarchs, and in the center a band of musicians performed an exquisite symphony. The soft strains of the merry wang, the lively notes of the dundo, and the martial accompaniment of the gumbe made with their united noises a discordant harmony, whose powers the lyre of Orpheus could not equal, and which would certainly be enough to frighten all the hosts of pandemonium. The oratio being finished, the African prince arose and, making an obeisance to the company, cleared his throat and began to address them as follows. Gentlemen and vampires. But the vampires, expressing a resentment against this breach of etiquette, he corrected himself. Vampires and gentlemen. But the Negroes were no more willing to come last than the vampires and a loud growl accompanied by a slight hiss again interrupted the orator. He was not, however, disconcerted, but like Mr. Burke, thundered out an iteration of the offensive sentence. Yes, said he. I repeat it, vampires and gentlemen? Shall not the immortal precede the mortal? Shall not those whose diet surpasses the nectar and ambrosia of celestials precede the ephemeral race? who fatten on the unclean juice of brutes? 
the rank essence of esculent productions, or the nauseous liquor of the distillery? Applause. Hear, hear, and see, boy, from the vampires, groans from the Negroes. Gentlemen of color, I appeal to yourselves. Shall not the descendants of the gods be named before the offspring of the earth-born image, whom Titan impregnated with celestial fire? For Prometheus was the first vampire. You must all know, as you have undoubtedly read Ascleus, that the vulture who preyed on his liver was neither fish, flesh, nor fowl. He is called a dog, which makes him a quadruped. He is represented as upu, creeping, which proves him an insect, and is said to have wings, which shows that he was a bird. Thou from this amphibious monster have descended the crows, the jackals, and the bloodhounds, the pirate bat of Madagascar, and the man-killing Ivunches of Chile, the sharks, the crocodiles, the krakens, the horse leeches, the Cape Cod sea serpents, the mermaids, the incubi, and the succubi. Loud cheering from the vampires. From Titan himself descended the cyclopes, and all other ancient and modern anthropophagi, and in lineal descent the Moko tribe of our own Ibos, to whom I have honor of being related. Those of you, too, are his posterity, who after your deaths return to your native land, the true Elysium, where the balmy bowel of the cocoa, the soft bloom of the anana, and the coal-black beauties of the clime of love, shall forever reward your fortitude and steep in forgetfulness the memory of your wrongs. Hear, hear, from the Negroes. But none of these genera or species of our order must longer engage your dignified and charitable attention. I come to ourselves, full-blooded, unadulterated, immortal bloodsuckers. To ourselves, whether ghouls or afrites, or vampires, rucolochas, vordalachos, or brocolocas. To ourselves, the terror of the living and of the dead, and the participants of the nature of both. To ourselves the emblems at once of corruption and of vitality, blotted from the records of existence and replenished to repletion with circulating life, abandoned by the quick and unrecognized by the dead, at once relics and relicts, rocked on the bases of our own eternities, the chronicles of what was, the solemn and sublime mementos of what must be, unqualified approbation from both sides of the house. The estate of vampirism is a fee tale and may be docked in two different ways. The first mode is the sanguinary practice of perforating the subject with a stake, and this is final. The other is produced by the gentler operation of the narcotic potion you behold in this file, by whose lenient and opiate influence the individual is restored to the plight in which he was previous to his death or his becoming a vampire and belongs to the obia mysteries. But to come to the object of our present meeting, sublime and soul-elevating theme, the emancipation of the Negroes, the consecration of the soil of St. Domingo to the manes of murdered patriots in all ages. No matter whether the bill of sale was scrawled in French or in English, no matter whether we were taken prisoners in a battle between the Leofaris and the Jackoffs, or in a skirmish between the Sambos and the Sawpits, no matter whether we were bought for calico and cotton or for gunpowder or for shot, no matter whether we were transported in chains or in ropes, in a brig or a schooner or a 74, the first moment we came ashore on St. Domingo, our souls shall swell like a sponge in the liquid element, our bodies shall burst from their fetters, glorious as a curculo from its shell. Our minds shall soar like the car of the aeronaut, when its ligaments are cut. In a word, O oh my brethren, we shall be free. Our fetters discandied and our chains dissolved, we shall stand liberated, redeemed, emancipated, and disenthralled by the irresistible genius of universal emancipation. Unparalleled bursts of unprecedented applause. Such was the report of this oration taken down in shorthand by Zembo, of whose extraordinary sagacity so many proofs have been exhibited, and who was never unprovided with materials for any emergency. 
The fiery oratory of the prince communicated such inspiration to the auditors that the whole mass of their thick blood leaped up with the quickening pulse of anticipated freedom. They danced and sung with violent gesticulations like perfect corybantes. But unfortunately, their pyrex were interrupted by the glittering bayonets of the soldiery who poured in upon them from every quarter and hemmed them in with a bristling chevaux de frie of steel. The vampires, surprising but undaunted, unsheathed their sabers and drew up in a gallant style, as if determined to die game, being indeed assured that, like so many phoenixes, they would rise from their own ashes as often as they might be cut down. A desperate conflict ensued, during which Mrs. Persone observed the file, mentioned by the prince lying on the ground, and very thoughtfully put it in her ridicule. The slaves, seeing how the business was likely to terminate, prudently sneaked off, while the attention of the military was occupied by the vampires. The former were violently exasperated to find all their labor so unprofitable, since while they themselves were wounded by every blow of their opponents, the latter, like so many ninipins, were set up, as fast as they were bowled down, bending to the storm like masts on a tempestuous ocean and rising again upon the billow in perpendicular triumph. But, being instructed by Zembo, the soldiers pinioned them as fast as they fell and prevented their rising by sitting in great numbers on their bodies, though the task was somewhat like that of detaining Quicksilver beneath the fingers. The prince, however, still fought desperately. Brandishing a huge scimitar in either hand, he swayed his arms like the sails of a windmill while limbs, heads, and bodies flew about him, curvetting and dancing in the air, as when the ingenious Mr. Haffy pulls to pieces a coach or an old woman, children, chickens, friars, and petticoats dance about in wild confusion, till the artist's hand again brings order out of chaos. Or, as when the renowned knight of the bedchamber, whose name eternal vases shall record, saw the ungenerous character on the wall, wielding a ponderous jug, he smote the innocent tables, chairs, and bedposts, and strode victorious over the gory field. So fought the prince, till being neatly pricked in the spine, unexpectedly he soused, as Johannes Porco Latinus remarks, in Principia Fundamentalia, and was immediately set upon by a host. So when a Gotulian lion is pierced by the light bamboo, overpowered by the hunters, he struggles in his thrall like an Enceladus under Etna, and dies at last with heart-wrung tears of anguish and reverberating roars of the hatred. Stakes were immediately procured and the whole internal fraternity securely disposed of, as their compeers described by Homer with burning chains fixed to the brazen floors and locked by hell's inexorable doors. With their bellowings, the vast chambers of the subterranean rung like the caverns of Delphos, when the inflammable air was fired by the crafty priests. The inhabitants of the island started up from their slumbers in shuddering terror and believed that an earthquake was rumbling beneath their feet. Mr. and Mrs. Persone and Zambo lost no time in trying the effects of the African stolen prescription. Being thrown into a tranquil slumber, they were conveyed to their plantation and awoke the next morning perfectly well, excepting slight colds in the head. Mr. Persone, having been in the status quo for sixteen years, was now much younger than his lady, a circumstance for which she was not at all sorry, and which he himself declared by no means displeased him. The remainder of their life was serene as a tropic night illumined by the mild effulgence of domestic love, fanned by the soft aspirations of peaceful bosoms, and enlivened by the firefly scintillations of rapture. Zembo, to whose taste and ingenuity they were indebted for their happiness, and who was baptized with the Christian name of Barabbas, after an uncle of his mother's, recorded what the reader has perused. One only circumstance, like one of those claps of thunder frequently heard in the unclouded sky, passed over the tranquility of their bosoms. Mrs. Persone's fourth husband's child was a mulatto and of vampirish propensities, of which his mother and Mr. Persone were never able entirely to cure him, having used up all the African's preparation. The intelligent reader, if any there such be, will remember that this narrative commenced with the name of Mr. Anthony Gibbons, of whom nothing has since been said, 
and whose adventures, to use a forum trope, must remain buried in the bowels of futurity until a more convenient opportunity. He is a lineal descendant from the last mentioned mulatto, and the manuscript, which is now given to the public, was transmitted to him from his ancestors. He is a resident in Essex County, New Jersey, and candor requires us to state that he is no relation to his celebrated namesake at Elizabethtown, as it is notorious to all who have had the pleasure of witnessing the size of the latter gentleman's waist, that he has too much bowels for so diabolical a profession. And it is to be hoped in charity that though he is such a delicate morsel, when he is laid in the sepulchre of his father's, he may not prove a tidbit to glut the thirst of a vampire. Moral In this happy land of liberty and equality, we are free from all traditional superstitions, whether political, religious, or otherwise. Fiction has no materials for machinery, romance no horrors for a tale of mystery. Yet, in a figurative sense, and in the moral world, our climate is perhaps more prolific than any other, in enchanters, vampires, and the whole infernal brood of sorcery and witchcraft. The accomplished dandy, who in maintaining his horses, his tailor, etc., absorbs in the forced and unnatural excitement of his senseless orgies the lifeblood of that wealth which his prudent sire had accumulated by a long devotion to the counter. What is he but a vampire? The fraudulent trafficker in stock and merchandise, who having sucked the whole substance of a hundred honest men, is consigned for a few weeks to the sepulchre of the jail and then by the potent magic of an insolvent law stalks forth, triumphant with bloated villainy, more related in his shameless resurrection to renew his career of iniquity and of disgrace. What is he but a vampire? The corrupted and senseless clerk, who being placed near the vitals of a moneyed institution, himself exhausted to feed the appetite of sharpers, drains in his turn the coffers he was appointed to guard. Is he not, I appeal to the stockholders? Is he not a vampire? Brokers, county bank directors, and their disciples, all whose hunger and thirst for money, unsatisfied with the tardy progression of honest industry, by creating fictitious and delusive credit, has preyed on the heart and liver of public confidence and poisoned the currents of public morals. Are they not all vampires? The whole tribe of plagiarists under every denomination, the critic, who by eviscerating authors and stuffing his own meager show of learning with the pilfered entrails ekes out his periodical fulmination against public taste. The forum orator, who without compunction barbarously extenterates Burke and Curran and Phillips. The second-handed lawyer, scholar, theologue, who quote from quotations and steal stolen property. The divine who preaches Tillotson and Top Lady. What are they all but vampires? The empiric who fills his own stomach while he empties his shop into the bowels of the hypochondriac. The bibliopolist who guts the fobs of the whole reading community by ascribing to Lord Byron works which the author never saw. The philanthropic contractor for the army who charges more for lime and horse beef than his quantum Marriott for the best provisions. Who sets up his carriage and his palace by blistering the mouths and destroying the intestines of thousands. What are these but vampires? The professors and disciples of Surgeon's Hall, who when a fine fat course is rolled out of the resurrectionist budget, set up a howl of horrible transport, like the anthropophagus caribs in Robinson Crusoe, glut their gloating eyes with the pingidity and unctuousness of the subject, and wet their blades like Shylock impatient to attack the Ilia. What are they but vampires? And I, who, as Johnson said of a hypochondriac lady, have spun this discourse out of my own bowels and made as free with those of others, I am a vampire. The End <laughs>